Hello everyone and welcome to another Everton show. It's Merseyside Derby week so there's much to look forward to and we'll be doing so in the company of a very special guest presenter. <laughs> Of course, we'd much rather Leighton Baines be at home right now, putting his feet up before the derby at the weekend. But nonetheless, it's a pleasure to have him here in the studio. Well, as well as looking ahead to the 225th meeting of Everton and Liverpool at Goodison Park on Sunday afternoon, we will, of course, be reflecting on a night of high drama at the Hawthorns earlier this week, when the Toffees came from 2-0 down to take all three points. In fact, it's another packed Everton show. In football you always get measured by that reaction and what you want to do with the situation that is presented in front of you and I think today as a, as a test, as a challenge is as big as it gets in football. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, I was really looking forward today to coming along and having a look at it but it's, it's blown me away. You know, uh, we've been to Alder the last 10, 15 years since I've been back at the club uh, and you see this new facility, it's incredible. I asked the players tonight, could they perform and could they win the game? Um, and they've done that and I'm delighted for them. And then, was it the year after? The scrap of Westerveld? <laughs> was if, that the year? If you can call it that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, as you know, Derby Week, all the Blues come in to, to wish us luck and, and Jamie's, <laughs> Jamie's turned up to, to wish us luck this week, so, you know, good on him. Leighton, welcome to the Everton Show, your Everton Show debut. Only one place to start, the Hawthorns on Monday night. The lads showed incredible character. Yeah, they did. I think that was um, probably the most pleasing aspect of it for me. Obviously, the three points, but you know, going two goals down there is you know it's a it's a tough ask from there. And I think getting the goal back as early as we did certainly helped. But I thought you know we showed character that you know if, in all honesty, we, last season was probably what maybe we were missing at times. And I think you know it, it looks like it's back in there at the moment, and and the lads done brilliant. Was that the crucial aspect of the result, scoring so quickly after we'd conceded the second goal? I think so because it doesn't give them time to, you know, if if Tony Pulis decides then to really shut up shop and you know change the shape again, get even you know more men behind the ball or whatever. It doesn't really give them time to to get set up, and also you know it doesn't give the game time to set into you know that sort of rhythm. So we we got the game, the goal back early enough to sort of. You know, I have plenty of time to go on and win the game. When we went two 0 down, did you think the game was gone? You do, but you also, you know, you, you straight away you think we need one as soon as possible. And um, you know, I was, I was watching it at home. I'd just gone into the kitchen, and it was I was watching it with my little lad, and he shouted that we'd scored. So I was straight back in there in front of the telly. <laughs> it was a night of high drama down at the Hawthorns, and Everton are now unbeaten in six away games this season, four in the Premier League and two in the Capital One Cup, which is an impressive record by anyone's standards, but undoubtedly the most dramatic one was, of course, in the West Midlands on Monday night. Backed by yet another jam-packed away end, the Toffees clawed their way back from two down to take maximum points. And as you can imagine, Roberto Martinez was a very proud man after the final whistle. In football, you always get measured by that reaction and what you want to do with the situation that is presented in front of you. And I think today, as a, as a test, as a challenge, is as big as it gets in football, uh, going 2 nil down and trying to find a way to get back against probably the best defensive st structure in, in the Premier League, being able to, to get that win that uh, we knew how important it would be is as satisfying as, as it gets in terms of showing that responsibility, that character and what we got in the dressing room. When you go 2-0 down, it's important to strike back quickly and that's exactly what we did. Yeah, yeah. I think the first half performance, we were all probably off uh, one or two percent. Um, we weren't given enough um, options on the ball. We weren't defending with intensity. We weren't stopping West Brom from uh, getting some sort of momentum. I'm not saying that it was a, a really bad first half, but it wasn't up to the standards that we have. And West Brom took advantage in probably in the only chance that they had and, and they deserved to, to, to get ahead. Now the reaction at half-time was, was exactly what you want. It was a real sense of stepping forward and everyone increasing the level and everyone taking responsibility. But then you get a, a, a real blow with considering a set play, which uh, we never lost composure. We never lost ourselves in terms of left uh, being left 
open and, and allow West Brom to control the game. It was the opposite. We took control. We got an early goal. But it's, it's very significant that the three goals are from open play. The three goals are um, with a, a lot of quality. And at the end, to see a well worthy and, 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 and well worked three points with the support that we had always when we're facing our fans away from home, it seems that it gives us that extra bit of energy, that extra bit of intent. And, and all in all, I thought the second half performance was a real celebration of our football club. Big Rom scores two, sets one up. Not a bad night for the boy. No, and I'm sure that we were all very disappointed with the first half. I think Rom and everyone else, uh, we were not up to up to the level. But then you you you're not uh, judging in accepting things. You're judging, reacting, and, and taking responsibility. And I thought the second half display, uh, he con was contagious. He was he was the probably the one that he made this tick in front of goal and he was brave, he, he was in, intuitive and I thought it was a, a great display in front of goal in that second half performance. Leighton, we needed goals after going 2-0 down and once again, big Rom in the right place at the right time twice. Yeah, he was and you know when, as the manager was saying after the game, when your performance level isn't quite where you want it to be, there's a few things that can still get you the result and you know one of those things is you know the desire but one, another thing is, you know, having a striker who can come up with goals and, you know, we have both in the second half and, you know, credit to Ron for getting us back into the game. 42 goals for Everton in 90 games. It's a good record for someone who essentially is still a young man. It is. It's a, it's a great record and I think, you know, his record overall is, is very good in the, in the league. You know, he scored a lot of goals in Europe last year as well. So, you know, I think... That's what everyone knows about him. You know, he's got goals in him, and you know, hopefully, we can keep providing him with the service to get them. Well, it certainly worked at the Hawthorns, that's for sure. It was Romelu Lukaku, though, not surprisingly, who took the plaudits after the game and made the subsequent headlines in the following morning papers. But it was another good night for Aruna Kone. The Ivorian has really turned his Everton life around, and in doing so, has won the hearts of the supporters who perhaps had grown a little bit frustrated at maybe not seeing the best of their six million pound striker. Before we hear from Aruna Kone, though. Leighton, he's really turned himself around at Everton and I would imagine the lads in the dressing room are delighted for him. He has, yeah, and we are very happy for him because, you know, he's had a serious injury, Aruna, and I think we didn't see the best of him because, you know, partly because of that and he was still working on it and he still does a lot of work now. But I think, you know, it's a fairer time to judge him now and he's started to, you know, produce better performances, come up with goals and... I think there's a little bit of chemistry there with him and Rom as well. Mm. When they're on the pitch together, they bounce off each other. And I think, you know, there's something in those two together. He certainly used to play well for Wigan against Everton, didn't he, Aruna Kone? Yeah, he did. And I think, you know, in some respects, that elevated the expectation levels. And when we brought him in, we just remembered, you know, what we'd seen of him, you know, at Goodison Park and, you know, over at Wigan when we played against him. But as I say, he took a serious injury and it took him a little bit of time to, to get back. But I think, you know, we're starting to see him getting back to those levels that, w that we'd seen against us. Starting to see the smile back on his face as well. He's certainly in a rich vein of form, is Aruna Kone. And despite not having the best grasp of the English language, he was only too pleased to discuss the West Brom game with Everton TV. Yeah, I think uh, this victory is a very good performance for, for the team. Uh, we, we can play like that. Uh, I think this year Everton go to to do something in this league. What did the manager say to you when he put you on as a substitute? What were your instructions? <laughs> my instruction? Yeah, the manager told me uh, he need my fresh and tell me if I can help Romelu in the front to to, to win this, this game. And what he told me, I. I, I I have to 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 score this game and I try I score and after very uh, this pass was very nice and Rulo was very fantastic this night. In the second half, Gerard De La Feo put some lovely crosses in, didn't he? Yeah, Gerard, uh, now Gerard is uh, physically is very better. I think this year Gerard go to help this team to to win most game. What was the message that you had when you celebrated the goal? <laughs> this message is for my wife. Uh, Today is uh, she birthday. Okay. Yeah. And uh, big rom 
scored two goals and set one up. So he's done a good night's work, hasn't he? Yeah, big room. When Romy is, is is better, I think he he helped the team to to play very well. And this night he scored two games. And I think it's very good for for him. Romer is very very good striker. He's strong. It's very important for for the team. How do you feel yourself now, Aruna? Are you would you say you're back up to 100% fitness? Yeah, no. Uh, I'm feeling very very well now, but uh, no. Uh, I'm not in 100%, but I I continue to to work my my fitness, and I think in I go to to help the team this year because now I'm feeling good and I every day is very important for me. He's a lovely lad, isn't he, Aruna Kone? And that's just about it for part one of this week's Everton show. After the break, we'll hear from David Unsworth. We'll feature some big news from Everton in the community and Alder Hay Children's Hospital. And, of course, we'll have plenty more conversation with Leighton Baines. Welcome back to part two of the Everton Show. Leighton Baines is alongside me for this week's programme and he's been keeping himself involved in off-the-field matters during his enforced injury layoff. Only recently he joined Graeme Sharp at Alder Hay Children's Hospital for an exclusive tour of their brand new facility. It's mind-blowing, you know, the facility that they've put in place, the amount of thought that's gone into every small detail. Um, and I think this is going to be an amazing facility. You know, it'll clearly be the, the best facility for for kids in, in the country. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, I was really looking forward today to coming along and having a look at it, but it's it's blown me away. You know, uh, we've been to Alder Hay the last 10, 15 years since I've been back at the club, uh, and you see this new facility, it's incredible. You know, and all credit to people involved. Uh, but every corner you turn, there's something that just takes your breath away. You know, just looking out now at the, uh, the main entrance, you know, you can just imagine in a, in a couple of months' time or a, a couple of weeks' time, when it's actually an operation. You know, it's a fantastic facility for the people of Liverpool. Everybody knows what a fantastic job Alder Hay does, but this still will make it even better. Even though I knew the scale of it, it wasn't until the last few months I've really seen the scale of it. When you see it come out the ground, it gets pretty big and it keeps growing and growing. But when you put people in it, when you see the equipment come in, when you see people's responses to it, when you see the reaction of people to the building, that's when you realise it's big. Not big in a physical sense, but big in an emotional sense. It's a building that will it makes me feel happy being in it, but it's a building that will change the way children view hospitals. That's what our aim always was, to make a hospital that didn't feel like one. You know, the kids have actually had an input, and you can see their input, you know, in the different uh, corridors and wards you walk into. Uh, but no, listen, the hospital's never a nice place. It's never an easy place. But certainly this facility will, will make it a little bit easier for, for the children and also the parents of, of the children who unfortunately have to come along here. But, uh, you know, fair play, it's fantastic. It's been a tough task, I think, to to bring it all together for the people who have been working on it. Like you say, it's one thing, you know, coming up with the design and, you know, getting a building ready, but, you know, you've got to transport a lot of patients across and, and you know, get them bedded in, really, to, to the new surroundings. And, you know, you, you can't appreciate it enough, really. You know, even when you come down and see it, um, you, beca you become aware or you get made aware of something else, you know, that's that's needed to be done and the amount of people that have put so much work into it is incredible. Leighton, I was with you and Sharpie on that tour and the most bizarre part of having a look around what is a fantastic complex was when they introduced us to small robots who make their own way to the linen room, get the dirty linen, bring it downstairs to be washed and take clean linen back. That was incredible. I still haven't got my head around that one. No, well, sort of still haven't seen them in action yet, so I'm not <laughs> going to totally believe it until I see them in action. But yeah, we did go down and take a look at them and say so that's just one of the amazing details about the place. Fantastic place, isn't it? Yeah, it is. You know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to actually going back with the lads, you know, when we do our visit and stuff. And, you know, it, it's such a great uh, environment. I say no one ever wants to be in hospital. No one wants to be in hospital with the children. But it's certainly, you know, a lot more comfortable and it's going to be a lot more bearable for people when they do have to go there. One of the highlights of Christmas for the people and the children, the staff and the parents at Alder Hay is the visit of the Everton First Team squad and it's a fabulous afternoon, isn't it? It is and it's it's one of the it's one of the perks of the job, I think, you know, mm. the, for us to be able to go down and, you know, 
you know, have an effect on people's day in that way and, you know, just get to spend some time with, with the kids down there. It's something that we always look forward to doing and, you know, as I say, I'm really looking forward to, you know, going back there with the lads as a group. The boost, the visit is a boost to the staff as well, isn't it? It is because sometimes, you know, you, you, you're stuck in your, your normal routine, your day-to-day -day job and, you know, you, you can start to take things for granted a, a little bit and going down there certainly takes you back away from that and makes you appreciate, you know, just, you know, normal things that you wouldn't, you'd normally take for granted, like your health. Just on a broader aspect, Everton in the community by reputation is the best in the Premier League and the lads enjoy being involved in the many schemes, don't they? Yeah, because as I say, you, you do get a real good feeling from it when you go down to, to one of the events, you know, whether it be a school visit or a hospital or, or whatnot, that, you know, when you get there and you see the reaction of the people, you know, particularly, you know, young kids, you know, they're, they're really made up to see the lads when they turn up there and it's good to be able to, you know, have an influence in that way. You were still on your crutches in that piece of film. You're not now. How's the injury, by the way? It's all right. I'm just sort of just sort of past the halfway stage, and I'm hoping to get outside and start doing some running pretty soon. So um, I've been working hard these last couple of weeks to get to that point. So you know, just trying to kick on from there. Are you an impatient patient? I am. I've had to um, I've had to rein myself in a little bit. They want me to, you know, not to get ahead of myself. So I've done that. I've stuck to all the. Um, the sort of dates that have been set because I'm normally, um, you know, try and jump ahead of it and, and get back earlier. So, you know, we're on course at the moment for where we need to be. I was going to say, how do you fill your time? But I suppose you've got less time to fill when you're injured than when you're not. Yeah, you do. I'm, you know, I've been in earlier um, and getting a session in, you know, on some days before the lads get in and then we meet together every morning and then I, you know, get my other session in while they're out training and then we'll normally hang around, get some treatment and, and go again. So, you tend to, you know, be around the place a lot longer than doing a bit more work because obviously it's it's what's needed. And you spend time helping out with Everton in the community as well. Well, back to the football now, and it's not just the first team who have been salvaging results after falling behind. On Tuesday night at Southport, Everton under-21s entertained Norwich City and showed that anything the seniors can do, they can match. Everton under-21s returned to winning ways with a 3-1 victory yeah. against Norwich City on Tuesday evening. But just like the first team 24 hours earlier, the Young Blues had to come from behind to get all three points. The visitors opened the scoring from the penalty spot on 32 minutes when Todd Cantwell was fouled in the area. Striker Yamal Lazar then stepped up to convert from 12 yards. Brazilian fullback Felipe Mattioni, who is currently working with the team, helped get the Toffees back in the game when his marauding run was halted illegally. And John Joe Kenny levelled from the spot. Everton then scored a quick-fire double midway through the second half. From a corner, the ball was knocked down and there was defender Mason Holgate to grab his first goal in Royal Blue from close range. Two minutes later, Callum Connolly drove forward from his holding midfield roll and unleashed a low drive into the bottom corner to seal the win. The under-21s climbed to fifth in the league table and coach David Unsworth was pleased with the performance. We started really well. Uh, we had a great first 20 minutes. We pressed them, uh, pressed our life out of them, and won the ball back. And just actually said to Tom um, on the bench that you know we needed to score in that in that period because uh, we were on top and we were we were looking good. And and then we we get caught and and, and you know we, we give a penalty away and um, you know we're one nil down. So uh, you don't always get what you deserve. Um, but we, we regrouped at half time. We we tinkered with the system and. Um, you know, we got back into the game just before half time. So I thought the second half, the way we went about our game, we scored at vital times, um, and we looked dangerous. Some of our play was very good. Uh, our team shape was was a very good as well, uh, and it was a solid performance. Uh, and we've won a game of football, which, which um, I asked the players tonight, could they perform and could they win the game? Um, and they've done that, and I'm delighted for them. Leighton, we've got some smashing young players coming through, haven't we? We haven't, you know, they've proved that over the last few seasons. I think, you know, and the lads who've been involved with the first team as well, when they have been asked to come over and step up, and you know whether they've just been travelling or actually playing, they've always been up to the, up to the mark. Are they nervous when they get sent over to the first team to join in a couple of sessions? I would imagine they are. Um, yeah, some of them, you know, it all depends on obviously on on the characters, but generally they are. But you know, we're quite lucky in the setup that we have. You know, they're never too far away from us. It's not like you know a whole different base that they have to come across to. The, they're around us all the time. We share a facility. We see each other all the time. So, you know, they're quite familiar with us, and I think that helps because when they do come across, if, you know, they're more comfortable 
they are, you know, the more that it's going to, you know, make them comfortable and reflect better on the training pitch. That's one of the many advantages of being a Finch farm is that because when we were at Belfield, if the kids wanted to train with the seniors, they had to come up from Netherton and perhaps were a little bit overawed by it all. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. I think just the fact that, you know, we're with each other all the time. We we shared, in, you know, a room, a canteen. You know, we pass each other in the corridor. We're in the gym together. You know, you get to you get to know them. I done me, you know, me first rehab. I done with Matty Pennington. Mm. You know, we were together for two months running around, and you know, I'm with Kieran now doing the doing the same um, thing. So, I think you know that definitely helps the younger players, and it, and it's good for us as well. It keeps us on our toes. The good lads as well, aren't they, Matty and Kieran and the boys? Very good lads, and I think you know, as I say, it's always good to have. You don't want anyone to be injured, but it's always good to have a, a rehab partner so you're not running on your own. And he's a good runner, Matty, as well. So, <laughs> you know, it, it was good for me to have him around. You were a teammate of Dave Dunsworth, weren't you? Yeah, for a while. I, you know, we'd come to, come to Wigan when, you know, I don't, don't know if it was, um, well, it was definitely towards the end of his career, but he'd come over and, you know, he was helpful for me because he played in a similar position as well. And I was young. He was an experienced head and, you know, uh, from the same part of the world as well. So I think, you know, he was good for me to have around. And he took a very important penalty for Wigan, didn't he? That virtually kept them in the uh, in the Premier League. Well, yeah, to keep us in the league in the end, I think you know we had to win the game against Sheffield United. They just needed a point at the time, and you know, unfortunately, Ryan Taylor got injured in the first half quite early on, um, and that meant Unzi come on and you know therefore took the penalty. So you know, we we were definitely grateful to him on that day. Who would have taken it if he hadn't taken it? Well, I think it was I was due to take it. I, I walked over and picked the ball up and thought, oh, where am I going to put this? And I turned round and he just said, you know, give me that, lad. And I happily handed it over. <laughs> that was a sign of things to come because he works really well with the young players, doesn't he? He does, yeah. That You can see. I, I trained with them for about a week before I joined back in um, with the first team in pre-season. And you can see the amount of respect that the lads have for him. He's got a really good balance, hasn't he, with them where, you know, he doesn't have to say a lot. You know, they just know you know how how to act and and I think you know it it's a special thing that he's got going there I think Hunzi you know he's got the lads playing really well and you know for them to respect him as much as they do says a lot about him he's always got a smile on his face at Finch Farm hasn't he he has and I think that's the thing is he, he manages to do it with a smile you know the lads are really well disciplined and they know you know not to you know not to cross him but you know he sort of gets on with them like you know, almost like one of the lads' friends, and they know not to cross the line. I say it's a, it's a gift that he must have. I think you know it's a special thing for a coach to be able to have that relationship with his players. He certainly is an Everton legend, David Unsworth, doing a terrific job. We say it week in, week out with the under 21s, and another great result earlier this week. Well, that's just about it for part two of this week's show. But don't go away because after the break, it's the big interview. <laughs> Welcome back to part three of the Everton Show. Well, the usual format here is to feature a previously filmed in-depth interview with a special guest. We had Louisa Sahar last week, of course, and you may remember Duncan Ferguson the week before. But as we've got Leighton Baines no more than a six-yard box away, this week's big interview is a tap-in for us. Leighton, let's go right back to the beginning. Were you like thousands upon thousands of other Merseyside kids? You started playing football in the street? Yeah, that was it. Just, you know, in the front garden or, you know, out on the street. You know, and it'd be one of them. You'd start off with three or four, and they'd, you know, it wouldn't take long, and there'd be about twenty odd kids all running around playing, and you know, you'd you'd play for hours at the time. It's something you don't see quite as often nowadays, no. really. Who coached you? Who was your first ever coach? I'd have to say my granddad. Really, he used to have me in his front garden, teaching me about different runs, penetrating runs, and you know, I didn't understand it at the time, and he <laughs> used to show me examples of stuff. So I think, you know, it, that was the, the start of my sort of education, really, of football was through my granddad. The question I often ask professional footballers is, when did you realise that you were slightly better than the other kids? I honestly can't remember that ever happening. You know, when I was playing in teams and stuff, I never, I can't remember ever feeling like, you know, one of the better players in any of the teams I played in. You know, I just always used to try to hold my own, really, and do what I, do the best I could. And... You know, I can't really remember a time when I felt like I was better than, you know, any of the other kids. I don't I don't actually think that I was. I think I just sort of progressed nicely along the way. Must have played for some good teams if you weren't the best player, by the way. When did you start to think, or did you ever think, I want to play for Everton, I want to play for England? Yeah, I think the, um, the Everton one wasn't until 
Um, I spoke about this recently. It wasn't until um, I'd been at Wigan for a, about 18 months in the Premier League because I was always, you know, we come through, it was League One. So I was finding my feet and then we went up and we had a couple of years in the Championship and I got comfortable. We went to the Premier League and I thought, oh, they might sign someone else here. And they didn't, so I thought, oh, you know, I've got a chance. Um, after a year or so, um, there was a couple of clubs interested in the manager at the time. Paul Jewell spoke to me and, you know, he said, where do you see yourself? And I said, Everton. And I, I'd never really, as I say, I'd never really felt like I was due to leave or anything. I never sort of felt like I was, you know, in that position. And it, it, it didn't occur to me until until then, really, that, you know, I, I had an opportunity maybe to, to go to a bigger club. And when he asked me, you know, I said I wanted to go to Everton. Wigan Athletic was one of the most incredible football stories of all time. To get to the Premier League 25, 30 years after being in Northern Premier League, non-league football, you seem to adapt pretty seamlessly. Did you find the Premier League to your liking when you first arrived on the big scene? Yeah, I think we we just genuinely didn't know what to expect of it. Very few of us had, had played in the league before. I'd say we'd all come up together. It was a special time, really, for us. And we all came up together, really. And... You know, we we very much expected it to, or we expected the worst. And you know, we had our first game against Chelsea. We were spending a lot of money at that time, and they won with a last-minute goal, beat us two-one. And I think that gives us actually gives us a bit of self-belief because people thought we'd get be five or six on the day. Mm -hmm. And you know, we we sort of grew into it, and we had a great first season. And you got to the final of the of the League Cup at Cardiff, didn't you, one season, which was unbelievable. Yeah, we did. And as I say, I think we were still around probably fifth or sixth in the league at that time as well. We'd sort of stayed in that top six. You know, after the first couple of games, we started winning, stayed in that top six or eight, I think maybe, you know, for most of the season, got to a cup final. You know, we, we lost to a far better team in the end and ran out of legs. But, you know, and that took, took a little bit away from us, but we still finished, I think it was 10th in our first season, which no one expected. Well, we'll certainly pick up the Everton story in a few minutes. But as someone never too far away when the banter starts flying around at Finch Farm, Leighton is a key member of the Everton dressing room. He can count all of his teammates as good pals, but regularly and freely admits that Jags is probably his bezzy. So how much did the England international colleagues know about each other? Everton TV did an experiment recently to find out. Recording me now? Recording you and then also... I'm watching it. Oh, it's multiple choice though, isn't it? It is, yeah. Move yeah. on, it's all over this gas. <laughs> well, we obviously played against each other. Does that count as a meeting? I didn't I'll say that. I'll say I met him here. Playing against him. Joel Robles, Gerard Delafay, the Leighton Baines. <laughs> yeah, I've got a right chance. It can't be worse than Joel, it's got to be Joel. <laughs> Stephen Pino, Joel Robles, the Leighton Baines. Me. You reckon? Nah, Joel. I'm not having that much. I've got the worst <laughs> taste. Joel, again. It's what I've played. It's what I've played. <laughs> yeah. He did well there. Oh, Baz. Hey, Baz. I said, I can tell you how he's done now, can't I? You said no conferring. Well, I could just straight. Well, it doesn't mind. really matter how he's done now. Because it's how you do, isn't it? Oh, well, have you done well, Baz? Fancy mechanic. <laughs> well, it's probably me, Hibbo, and someone else. So you can have the options, please. Options are Darren Gibson, Phil Jagielka, or Leighton Baines. Oh, wow, well, he's put himself in. Oh, I didn't. Mona, are we saying? Biggest Mona. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna say he said himself, Bainsy. <laughs> <laughs> something like a tiger or something. Um, the options are G 
cheetah, fish, or moose? What sort of questions are these? Cheetah, fish, or moose? I've never heard him refer himself to a, to a moose. I'll go cheetah. Charming, cool, or realist? I said strange. Uh, charming. We'll go charming. The full Blues Brothers video, by the way, is available to watch now on the Everton YouTube channel. Leighton, we're speaking about your career in football. When and how did the move to Everton finally come about? I think, you know, we had a difficult second season with Wigan. Um, so I think the manager said, you know, we'll deal with it. We need to stay up. And, you know, we had that dramatic last game against Sheffield United, stayed up. And then I think it was just a case of, you know, me finding the club that suited best. There was a couple of offers. I went and met Roy Keane up at Sunderland and there was a couple of other people interested as well. But Everton were always interested, but, you know, they never put an offer in. So I, I wanted to wait for that. And so I went up and met Roy and told him at the time, you know, I, I just want to wait really and see if this Everton uh, move can happen. And it, it just took quite a while. Um, but in the end, it got done and I was made up. Was he happy with that, Roy Keane? No, not really, because I think they were due to go, I can remember they were due to go to Portugal on a training camp. And I, I think, I don't know if he said that, you know, they'd book me on any flight or book me a flight um, straight out there and, and stuff. And they probably offered me uh, more money and stuff like that at the time. And, you know, they seemed really keen to have a go. And they, um, he was saying, you know, he wanted to get a few other people through and he thought if, if he got me in, you know, that might happen, that might influence a couple of other people. Um, I can remember having to ring him and just say, look, I, I just want to wait and see if I can, you know, if Everton are going to come through with an offer. So Is that a nerve-wracking phone call? Yeah, I can remember <laughs> um, pacing around the kitchen, <laughs> building myself up to make the call. Um, but it was one that had to be made. You know, I, I went up there and met him and, you know, he seemed like a great guy at the time and stuff. And, you know, his plans for what he wanted to do seemed quite exciting, but... You know, I was just more excited about this. David Moyes can be a pretty persuasive character himself as well, can't he? Yeah, and, you know, I, I knew um, a few of the Everton lads already at the time. I was playing for the 21s with Borney and stuff, and um, Killer had moved from from Everton to Wigan and a couple of other people as well. So, you know, I had, you know, good references from all of them as well. Like a lot of people that sign for a, another football club, things didn't go all your own way right from the off, did they? No, it was a difficult first season. I think, you know, not really playing too often. And then I, I, I think I was out for about three months as well. I um, had an injury that I ended up, you know, I tried to I tried to sort of come back from it. But I was struggled for most of that season and just ended up having surgery at the end of the season to correct it and come back the next season. And, you know, I played a bit more and then become a regular, I think, later on in the year and sort of, you know, managed to stay in the team, really. One of the highlights of the David Moyes reign was the 2009 FA Cup semi-final, Manchester United at Wembley. You scored one of the penalties. Was that more nerve-wracking than ringing Roy Keane? No, because I think... Really? It, no, it's just because, for, you know, when you're playing football, it's like watching, I'm, as I've said before, I'm, I'm nervous watching, I'm not nervous playing. I think, you know, going up to a penalty shootout, you know, there's a little bit of nerves, but you you sort of, in some respects, in your comfort zone, you're doing what you feel like you know. Um, you know, I remember Tim, I think, had missed the first one, so there was a bit of pressure on it. So I was a bit nervous going up, and I think I, I think it went into the roof of the net. Um, so I just opened it, stayed underneath the bar, and then I was happy to see it go in. Is it possible to recall what's going through your mind as you walk forward from the halfway line to the penalty area to get the ball off the referee? Uh, I think if there is, then you probably your mindset isn't right, if you know what I mean. I think mm. when you, you're at your best when you're sort of on autopilot and you just go up and, and do it. You know you know where you're going to, if it's a penalty, you know where you're going to put it, you pick your spot and you do it. I think if, you, if you're thinking about your surroundings and what's happening, then you're probably a little bit out of the zone. That was a truly special day and a truly special penalty. We could talk for hours, I'm sure, Leighton Baines and myself, but the programme schedule people probably wouldn't be overly impressed. So we'll let them run a few adverts now, but don't go away.
because after the break, the countdown really starts towards the 225th Merseyside Derby. Welcome back to the fourth and final part of this week's Everton show. Only one topic of conversation for the next 12 minutes or so, and that, of course, is the first Merseyside derby of the season at Goodison Park. Everton may well start as the bookies' favourites, given the current standings in the Premier League, but as Leighton Baines knows, there's only one place with a form book, and that's the nearest wheelie bin. Form really does go out the window, Leighton, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It's, it's a game on its own, really. You treat it almost like a, a cup game in some respects, or you'd certainly talk about it in the same light. You know, was that anyone is really concerned about is is the result and winning the game and you know I think you know our form going into it's quite good but if it wasn't we'd be using that line you know that form doesn't matter so you know hopefully the the lads just go out there and and produce you know the type of performance they did last time we were at Goodison against Chelsea. Let's hope so. Well, Tim Howard has played more Merseyside derbies than most of the players who will be on display on Sunday. But the American admits the occasions are still ones that he really looks forward to, especially with our solid start to the season. Well, I mean, I think going into the season, people said the first 10 games is tough. And my, my answer to that was, you know, August until May is very tough in the Premier League. So it doesn't matter who you face. And we've, we've taken it week by week and we've prepared for each opponent differently. Um, but most importantly, we focused on ourselves, and I don't think that will change. Yeah, we've got some big games coming up, but uh, as, I, as I mentioned, every single week is tough. It really, really is. That's not lip service. It's, it's hard to go away to Swansea, just as it's hard to play against Liverpool in the derby. It's, it's a difficult task, but we're up for it. Before you came to the Premier League, what was your impression of a Merseyside derby? Was it uh, a bit of a distant connection? It was, it was blood and thunder, and it was, uh, you know, a bit of rock and sock and robots, and... Uh, always exciting games and I don't think that that's changed you know certainly not in my time uh, playing in the games they're exciting um, they mean everything to the city both red and blue and, and they, it means everything to the players as fans in the stands you know we might have a different view or experience of them but when you're in the, the middle of the pitch you've got all four stands at Goodison or Anfield all around you what's it like as a player the atmosphere it's electric it's like nothing else and I try and tell my my family, who hasn't been yet, you know, to make sure in the next couple of years before I retire that they get to a they get to a derby because uh, it's something that they'll you know, they'll never experience in their life, you know, outside of uh, being in, the, in between those four walls. We've had some draws in the derbies in recent years. We're not far away from getting the win. What do we have to do differently? Well, continue to concentrate on 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 our performance. You know, I think uh, you know, I think mentally we're 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 resilient. We're tough. I think the squad is as deep as it's ever been, and. Um, you know, more so than ever, we feel like we're we're ready to perform and, and ready to get the win. But we're, that's every week, you know, so it's not something that's, that will change for us. Leighton, it has been a solid start of the season for Everton, and part of that is certainly down to Tim Howard. Yeah, it is. He's made some, some big saves already this season that have, you know, kept us in games at crucial times. You know, you think back to the, the Southampton game. You know, we made a big save there. We go up the other end, score, and the game goes out of sight, and we win. And you know, keeping clean sheets, the likes of Southampton down at Spurs, he made a lot of good saves there as well. Probably got us a point that day. Mm -hmm. And you know, clean sheets at Swansea, he's been, you know, brilliant for us so far this season. And you know, hopefully we won't need them too often at the weekend. But if we do, he'll he'll produce that kind of form. He certainly is a man for the big occasions. He'll be right up for the Merseyside derby. There will, of course, be a regular derby day tormentor missing for Liverpool this Sunday. Stephen Gerrard, thankfully, some will say, will be a few thousand miles away when the game kicks off. But his best pal, Jamie Carragher, is most definitely on Merseyside. He was at Finch Farm earlier this week to do some filming and he caught up with one of his old derby opponents, Leon Osman. Well, as you know, Derby Week, all the Blues come in to, to wish us luck and, and Jamie's, <laughs> Jamie's turned up to, to wish us luck this week, so, you know, good on him. Obviously, Jamie, you're here with a neutral cap on today, I'd imagine. Well, I wouldn't go that far, but that's me and my role now with Sky covering the game. So it's a, it's a huge game, you know, for both clubs. But Derby Week is, is something that I, I miss. I've got, I'm now as a, a fan, a supporter, really. A Liverpool supporter, I should add. But uh, I know the feeling as a kid as well, being a blue, the build-up. And it was you know, totally different as a player because you can actually do something about it on the pitch. Now it's a bit more, bit more nerve-wracking. Yeah, you two are sort of the last of a dying breed, really. Sort of local lads who've got plenty of experience at Derby Day, so you've seen it from both sides. Was it? What's the anticipation like from your side, Oz? 
Good, you know, you, you want to play in derbies, but I've got to be honest, you uh, you only enjoy them if you've won. You know, you you have to build. Didn't enjoy many then, did you? <laughs> <laughs> Enjoyed enough, thank you. Uh, we had to build up all. You week. scored in a few, didn't you? Yeah, I scored in one. Oh, thanks for, for bringing that up. You scored, you scored in many. No. There we we go, just got an own goal, must not? There we go. There we go. We have scored more for us than I have in derbies. Uh, but yeah, you only really enjoy them when you win. Yeah. Jamie, how how strange is it, sort of? not being able to get the boots on out of a derby. Is this the day that is most frustrating as a, a former player? Yeah, definitely, and especially the one at Goodison. That was the game I look forward to most, start of a season. I mean, we were always sort of big favourites maybe to win at Anfield, but Goodison was always maybe more of a level anyway. Hostile crowd, tight pitch, and it was always a game I look forward to. And if there was one game I could pick every season to win, it'd be the Goodison derby, and uh, no, it was a great game to be involved in. And yeah, gutter than missing it. Yeah, I suppose you've got nice memories of a, a, a boiled blue. You changed allegiances, obviously, during your career. Yeah. But is it, what are your memories of Goodison as a, as a fan? Yeah. Uh, well, listen, Derby games, Liverpool at that stage, were, you know, winning titles were the, the best team around. I was fortunate enough in the early years as a kid, seven or eight, that Everton were the, the best team around, really, alongside Liverpool in that, that mid-80s spell. And my first Derby was at, uh, at Anfield, Graham Sharp scored the volley. Went to the two cup finals as well, 86, 89, didn't go so well. But at that time, I mean, you're talking about the two best teams in Europe, really, I think. Liverpool dominating the European Cup, Everton winning the Cup Winners' Cup, winning league titles. And it was a great time to be a, a supporter on Merseyside, really, and especially in Evertonian. And Ozzy, I think Jamie's admitted it on Sky on Monday night. We, we, he fancies us as the favourites for this game. We've had a good start to the season. What's the mood in the camp, Mike? Positive. Um, as you say, we're, we're in good form. We're... Um, we're confident we're, we're playing well so um, we're certainly going into it um, you know confident and, and hoping and expecting to to get a result but you know Derby's is is known for you know the form goes out the window and it's all about uh, who turns up and probably wants it most on the day so um, you know I'm just thankful Jamie's come to, to wish us you know as a, as a top blue he's come to, to wish us all the luck and then we'll see how it goes the weekend. Well, local players, of course, are what the Merseyside derby is all about. And one local boy who lived the dream and not only played for Everton in a Merseyside derby, but scored in one as well, was Francis Jeffers. He's been speaking to the Everton show about this most unique of football occasions. Being a local lad, uh, you know, never missing a Merseyside derby growing up. You know, being a season ticket holder and always getting a ticket for the Anfield fixture was, you know, when... When I made it into the first team, yeah, it was the first game I always look for. The Anfield derby for Franny Jeffers, you had some ups and you had some downs, didn't you? Yeah, uh, my first one I think I scored, if, yeah. I, if I remember rightly, we got beat 3-2. Mm -hmm. I think we took the lead, didn't we, after about 14 seconds or something like that. We the course, scored early doors. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I came off the bench, got a goal. And then, was it the year after? The, the scrap of Vesterveld? <laughs> was that the year? If you can call it that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the handbags were in, yeah. So. <laughs> The Anfield ones, yeah, the few ups and downs. And it was a special night when, when Cam scored early doors and although you did get sent off before the end, it was, a, it was a wonderful night for Evertonians to win there, wasn't it? Yeah, and you know what? You know, I honestly fancied us that night, I genuinely did. I looked around in the tunnel and I thought, we've got bigger characters than them tonight. You know, we had a, we had a few local lads in and we also had the likes of Goffey and Kev, Davey Weir, Utch. You know, we, Nicky Barnby, we had characters all over the pitch. You need characters. them in the derby, don't you? You do. And I looked around at them and, you know, there was a few foreign lads who I thought it wouldn't really mean a lot to. Uh, and I think right from the way go, we, we were the better team that night and we deserved to win. There's a positive feeling at Finch Farm this week as well, isn't there? Yeah. But Without getting too carried yeah, away. Yeah, you know what, does it's, it's one of them, isn't it? It's, uh, it doesn't matter, does it, what, what's going on at either club? I mean, obviously, we've had a great result there. And we go into it and we'll probably be favourites, won't we? Looking at the way they're playing. And I do fancy us strongly, but everything goes out of the window. You know, there's times where, you, where, 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 the, where the team that aren't playing well go into derbies and win them. So, uh, nothing changes, really. It's, it's derby week, isn't it? And, uh, I'd be lying if I said... I don't fancy us strongly, though I, I genuinely think we'll, we'll win. Leighton, I said at the start of the programme we'd much rather you were at home relaxing ahead of the Merseyside derby because you'd be involved in it. Is this the worst time to be injured when the, 
the likes of the Merseyside derby comes around. It is, yeah, because it's it's a great game to to play in, obviously, and I think you know the Goodison one definitely is the one. You know, it's the it's the best one to to be involved in. But you know, having to sit and watch it, or even now the build up to it, I'm starting to you know get that little bit of nervous feeling because you know when you're involved in, as a player, you know you're just going through your normal preparation and getting ready for the game, and you feel fine, but. I think it's a lot different, you know, when you when you sort of just sit and watching it. And now I know what my mates tell me, you know, they feel like in the lead up to a derby. I get it now. It's Merseyside derby weekend. That's just about it for another Everton show. There hasn't been an Everton hat trick in a Merseyside derby for 84 years. It was four years ago yesterday since the last red card, and it's 11 and a half years since an Everton penalty. But come half past one on Sunday, the stats will count for nothing. My huge thanks to Leighton Baines for his engaging company. Thanks to you all for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the Everton show and that you have a thoroughly memorable Sunday afternoon.